alliances, right? I mean, why not? How many of you have ever been in an alliance? Well, like everybody has, right? I, I, I mean, I'm well, some of you maybe not, and I'm sorry, but I'm assuming all of you have had a friend. Uh, and that's really what we're talking about today is friends, right? We're going to use some very fancy words, cooperative alliances, you know, long-term affiliative relationships. I, I don't know. They throw all these fancy words out there. Jason, they're friendships, right? That's really what we're talking about here. Uh, who's your buddy? Uh, who are you going to stand up for when, when things get tough? And who are you just, I don't know, did I tell you guys the cornfield story? I didn't tell you this. Yeah. So I, I thought I had a friend once. Yeah, this was this was a, like a fun three weeks. Uh, <laughs> actually, Jason, this guy's my best friend. He really is. Uh, still is. And we've been friends for, for a long time now. Uh, in high school, we decided to go out to a haunted cornfield, right? I mean, why not, right? It's what you do. We didn't realize this was like, pre-Facebook days, right? And so we didn't realize like when you should show up for these things. So we just show up, it's dark. Haunted cornfield seems to be perfect, right, Tiffany? Uh, no one else was there. <clears throat> just the two of us and the people running the cornfield. And so normally I think for two people they would have said you're gonna have to wait. But I think there was some thing in the back of their mind that was like, only two people in a cornfield, this is gonna be fun, right? Uh, and so they, 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 they let us go in this corn, which is, Cornfields are creepy anyway in the middle of the night, right? And it's just, just me and this other guy. They keep squirting him in the ear with uh, the squirt. And he's, like, you know, getting really freaked out about it. And, you know, whatever, right? And so we're just, like, walking along. People are jumping out. There's a guy under a bridge, whatever, right? We're probably two-thirds of the way through this maze, right? And all of a sudden, a guy jumps out with a chainsaw. Now, it's, yes, a real chainsaw in the sense that I mean, it's a saw. There's no chain. They remove the chain because they don't actually want to hurt people, right? Okay. So he jumps out with his chainsaw, and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. Uh, my friend, uh, apparently really afraid of chainsaws, pushes me down <laughs> into the corn. I'm flailing backwards. He's running, like sprinting, like 30 yards down this cornfield, and everyone who works there is laughing. Like at that point, it's over, and we they just have to. Once he like calms down, we just have to walk out because we're done. It's like they can no longer try to scare us because it's over. Uh, so he just shoved me like like hand in the middle of the chest, right? I mean, and I'm just as he is just. I know, just just was gonna leave me there. I I don't know. And afterward, he said, "I'm just really afraid of chainsaws." I, I, I got that. I got that from the interaction, right? Um, other times, perfectly, perfectly great. Yeah. This was even after I saved him once from, uh, like, falling into this flooded creek. Uh, we had this bright idea we were going to go catch some frogs. It was a long story. Uh, and he slipped and went in uh, and, like, was, yeah, almost gone. Uh, and I pulled him out, and then he still pushed me into a cornfield. This just doesn't seem right. Man. Maybe I should do better at detecting cheaters. <laughs> so, that story, amazingly, is actually pertinent to this lecture. So we're going to talk about cooperative alliances. Now, last week, we talked about helping people, right? But we talked about helping people who share your DNA. This week, we're going to talk about helping people who don't share your DNA. Or at least you don't think they share your DNA. And Josh, this is something that I think they don't mention in here. Uh, there's always some uncertainty about who you're related to. Uh, it's different now. We're pretty confident who we're not related to. But when you're in a, in a, who knows, right? And so I think that's, that's some sort of Kickstarter that they don't, that they don't typically mention to this, which I think is an important Kickstarter. So anyway, let's talk about cooperation, right? Uh, not probably anybody in this class, but people in general often will make personal sacrifices uh, to help close friends, right? Okay. I don't want you to give me an example, but let's think of a time that a friend of yours has helped you or you've helped a friend, right? You took somebody to the grocery store because their car was uh, inoperable. You donated a vital organ to someone. Uh, I don't know, there's a million things you can do, right? You can help people, okay? 
Now, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense on some levels because, uh, you know, we've talked about natural selection. It's very competitive, right? Why would you want to help other people? Why would you, why would you want to sacrifice your time and effort and resources, right, Chris, and give that to somebody else because you're losing out? That seems like a bad idea, right? That's why I don't give people Christmas gifts, right? It doesn't make sense. If I give you a gift, what's going to happen? Am I going to get anything back? I don't know, right? It made sense to help relatives. Why did it make sense to help relatives? Mary, they can send some of your DNA to the future, right? And that's the whole point of this, sending your DNA to the future. But if I am pulling you out of a fire, if I'm you know, spending my time and my money and my energy and my resources to help you, how is that getting my DNA into the future? That's actually reducing the likelihood right now that my DNA is going to the future, right? Because instead of taking you to the grocery store, uh, I could be chatting up uh, that young woman who lives next door to me and trying to create a mating opportunity, right? So this is why you should never take anyone to the grocery store. You're going to miss out on mating opportunities. Right, Krista? You're just going to just agree with it. It's right, I promise you, okay? So, uh, so there you go, right? Sacrifices are costly for folks who make them. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that. And then there's some benefit to the folks uh, who get that, right? So under these conditions, like how, how could friendship or altruism, and we can get into this big debate about what is a true altruistic behavior, and we should think about that because there are uh, certain behaviors you do that that might be altruistic, but they don't involve a cost, right? So if you're already going to the grocery store and your friend wants to go with you, that's a big benefit to your friend because they don't have to drive themselves or get a, you know, uh, a ride there. <clears throat> but to you, there's no cost really, right? But that's still something very nice of you to do. So kind of keep those things in mind. All right. There are obviously some problems. Uh, with, with altruism, we already talked about inclusive fitness for relatives, okay? <clears throat> but how does this work with non-relatives? What's interesting about this is cooperation is pretty much a universal in human cultures, right? There, anybody know about that human culture that never helps anybody? It doesn't exist, right? Uh, so every culture that folks have, have looked at, it happens. Even, even very distantly related species to us uh, uh, speaking evolutionarily, engage in some forms of cooperation, <clears throat> right? They engage in behaviors that we would describe as altruistic, right? So here, this is this is maybe a good lecture we should have done last week because we're going to talk about vomiting vampire bats. Um, that would have been a nice pre-Halloween uh, lecture. But while you're still in the and in the cornfield story, as well. Uh, but there are vampire. You guys familiar with vampire bats? These are the ones that when they bite you, they turn you into a vampire. That's exactly how that works. Um, no, it's not. Uh, but what they do is they actually do uh, ingest blood, typically from livestock. Uh, and they need to do that about every three days in order to survive. Uh, they're not, some bats are not terribly skilled at this, particularly younger bats. Right, about a third of the time, they, they are not able to get food. So about, you know, one out of every three days, they're not eating. So that runs some risk, right, uh, of, of, of starvation. Older bats do a little better, but there's still probably 10% of the time that they don't uh, successfully uh, get blood, right? But what you'll see is vampire bats that, that have been successful that night, they'll actually regurgitate some of their blood that they've ingested, and I know this is really great, and feed that to the vampire bat that, that didn't get to eat, right? Nobody's trying to eat a meal while we're in the class. Uh, what's interesting about this is these vampire bats will only do this for bats Chandler with with whom they spend a lot of time right and there's actually a there's actually a real sharp threshold right like you have to spend this much time with the other bat uh, or you're not going to help them and that threshold is about 60% of the time like if you're seen with that other bat about 60% of the time you'll help it anything below that you're not going to uh, which is really really kind of interesting, right, that, that these vampire bats form these, these friendships. Uh, this has been extensively studied in other primates, including uh, chimpanzees. We might talk a little bit about chimpanzees later, political alliances, uh, and so forth, as they're trying to get those dominance hierarchies, right? Chandler? When you have somebody like a group of chimpanzees, you have like the operation, the 
<clears throat> the alpha male? Why would he help somebody? People have to help him. <clears throat> uh, so what's really interesting about this is, is yeah, uh, when you have these, uh, and chimpanzees have been studied most extensively sort of beyond humans, right? When you have these uh, chimpanzees, you have the, the, the male at the top of the hierarchy. Uh, what's, what's interesting is he uh, will sort of, he does a few things, right? Because there are many tools to, to reach dominance and maintain dominance. One of those is sheer physical domination, right? If you're the biggest chimpanzee, uh, if you're the strongest chimpanzee, if you've got the biggest teeth, uh, you you can can use those tools to directly and physically sort of beat yourself into dominance, uh, beat others into submission. You can also just use that in, in pure intimidation, right? Uh, I mean, you can just kind of walk around, and you'll actually see this in chimpanzees. The alpha males will kind of they walk in sort of interesting. They walk in a very exaggerated manner, like very much like you you know you see guys like walking around. You know, chimpanzees do this too. Right? It's not something we invented. Uh, I know, right, Mary? <laughs> so, uh, so the males are not primarily going to break up a fight. They will do something else, though. Um, they will uh, sort of curry favor with females. So you're not going to get to the top in, in, a, in a chimpanzee society without help from the females. And so what they'll do is uh, when the females, this is terribly interesting, uh, when the females are associating with with the alpha male, the alpha male will be nice to them, do some grooming maybe, uh, some reciprocal grooming, play with their, you know, little chimpanzee babies, right? No, seriously. When that female starts associating with another male, perhaps a rival, the alpha male will just come over and bite her. <laughs> it's like, I don't think so. Uh, seriously, no, th th this is, this is, this is what happens, right? So chimpanzees have this very, I, I, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, is it different than what humans do? Well, I mean, hopefully you're not going around biting people, but no, it's the same, right? I mean, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, the females are typically the, the peacemakers in a, in a chimpanzee troop, right? They'll be the ones who will typically go up and try to, to, to do some reconciliation after a fight, try to stop a fight, prevent a fight from happening. So they're, they're very important in that sort of, you know, uh, sort of that group dynamic there. Uh, but does that... Yeah, that was all great information. Yeah, yeah. Now, sometimes you'll have, uh, so you get a dominant male. Sometimes you'll get two other males who will try to gang up on him, right? Uh, because maybe alone. So there's an interesting story. Um, uh, there's this guy, Franz de Waal, who uh, he's down at Emory now. I mean, he's, this guy, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's brilliant. And um, I don't know, he's got... He's got, I'm like a third of the way through his most recent book. I wish it was a little farther, but that's okay. Um, he wrote a cool book called, um, uh, I don't know, what, oh, what was the title of it? That's the most recent one. Yeah, and then there was Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? Before that was The Bonobo and the Atheist. And then he wrote the one, is, Chimpanzee Politics is what I'm going to call it, but, but that's not right. Um, that's what it's about, though, right? I think he was kind of watching chimpanzees and reading the prints at the same time. <laughs> and so it was, was, you know, really like seeing some, some archetypes there. Uh, <clears throat> but there was this chimpanzee troop, and they had the alpha male. Uh, but the alpha male was getting a little older. Even though he was getting older, he was still very successful um, at maintaining that dominance. There were four males <clears throat> in this particular colony in the Netherlands. It was at a zoo. Uh, <clears throat> the top chimpanzee, uh, he had about 75% of all mating opportunities. And the other three were kind of splitting the remaining 25%, right? So one of those males <clears throat> got a growth spurt, like literally. And he got a little bigger and he decided he was going to start trying to become the dominant male. So he would go over and he would start just like slapping the current dominant male. And seriously, this is what he would do. Just like slap him in the face, do all kinds of stuff, stopped being submissive, was trying to get mating opportunities that he wouldn't have done before. Um, most of the females were still on the side of the, the sort of the incumbent, right? Uh, but eventually, sort of one at a time, they started going over like, you know, like man, this guy's actually bigger and younger and he's going to be pretty good. So they started going over to him. So he actually dethroned the old guy who went from 75% to 0% of mating. 
right? And then the top guy, he got 50% of the mating opportunities and the other two males were split in 25. 25. Uh, and so that lasted for a while until there was a third male who uh, started kind of, you know, up and coming. Now he wasn't quite big enough or strong enough or had didn't have the other alliances with the females to uh, dethrone the, the newest leader, but the old guy uh, who had been dethroned kind of saw an opportunity and the two of them buddied up and created an alliance and they worked together to dethrone the top uh, chimpanzee. That old guy, he did not become dominant again, but he went from zero mating opportunities up to about you know, 20, 25% of mating opportunities. Uh, so he, he made a big increase by affiliating himself with that new leader that was coming in. So it was this constant kind of term, turnover that occurred in this particular chimpanzee colony. It was really kind of fascinating. Yeah, that's extremely interesting. Yeah, it, it is. Is that the same book where you said humans are between group chimpanzees and within group bonobos? I think so. Uh, yeah. How was that relevant to that? In terms of cooperation, that is, since we're closer with Andrew than others. Yeah, so. So I think this comes down to, to sort of. I, I mean, so if. Let's just step back a bit, right? So if altruism is a thing, which it is, right? Why, why, why aren't we nice to everybody and helping everybody? Right? Where do we draw the line at who, who is in our alliance and who's not? Right? And I, I think that, um, yeah, that might have been what he was, he was going for there because we do work together as groups and within a group, <clears throat> we are very um, supportive of each other. But we have a ton of problems between groups and we're not, we're not terribly friendly to other groups. I don't know if you guys have ever caught on to that. That's a thing, right? Uh, and, and so you kind of draw your circle, however that gets drawn, which I, I think there are a lot of mechanisms to that. And then you try to protect and preserve that, um, and sometimes in a very physical and aggressive way. Hopefully we're getting away from that. I'm waiting until we solve all of our, our problems with like Scrabble games or something. That's, that's going to be exciting. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I think... Um, And I think this is a real, this is sort of like the problem, right? I mean, we can study these chimpanzee colonies and we've in some way though created an artificial environment for them because we're limiting their ability to, to leave. And in fact, giving people when they have the opportunity to leave uh, a situation, giving them that ability to leave actually changes the way they cooperate with each other. Um, it changes the way that they interact because they have that option to leave if somebody's cheating or not cheating. You don't have that option, then you know things are different. So I think, um, yeah, people are weird, right? Uh, but I, but I think his point there was we 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 have some characteristics where we're I mean we're not we're not totally just trying to dethrone each other all the time, but at the same time we're also not just well roll the dice and whoever's in charge and, and bonobos are very much. I don't know. I always think of them as some like kind of hippie commune uh, <laughs> when I think of bonobos <laughs> because I think I mean they're all vegetarians. They're all just kind of hanging out, but it actually works. Unlike when humans have tried this, it, it's never really worked, right? Like that that doesn't work for us. Um, yeah, Chandler, you've got more. So when talking about like optimism, if you could separate. The divide of like groups, and you know how I can say not just this expanse and outside. Within a single group, though, how much could something like a chimpanzee like handle altruism within a population? Like, how big does that population have to get before that altruism got solved? Cool. So, so what you're saying is like, yeah, how how many people am I willing to help, and how much am I willing to help them? Right. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know the exact number for, there's a limit on this though, right? There, there really is a limit. Um, and, and I think if you were to, yeah, I don't know. I've kind of thought.
thought about this some, right? Like um, you see these like GoFundMe projects, right? Like how much are you willing to contribute to that? Uh, and then how much are you willing to contribute to that if that person's from your hometown, if, even if you don't know them, or if that person shares some other qualities that are similar to you, right? I, I think you'd contribute more. Uh, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. And this is a real problem with our society now. And actually, we they kind of mention this in the book, right? Um, one, there aren't a whole lot of opportunities to really help people like there used to be. Um, most of us are not in life or death situations on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So there's not really that opportunity for you to really do something. You know, um, when you're when you're in a situation where you know food access on average is much easier today than it was a millennia ago, right? And so you know, giving your friend a turkey sandwich when he comes over to watch a football game is not really it's it's nothing for anybody. But if you were giving your friend some meat today because he, he wasn't able to acquire anything, you know, he, he him and his family are, are living now and, and otherwise they wouldn't be. You've given him a small sliver of meat, so there's some big benefit there, not really a huge cost to you, right? Um, and so that that that's a different type of connection than we see now. I think too, when as Josh said, when we're living in groups of a couple hundred people, um, you, you can be very, um, you know, you can really, you can really work within those bounds, right? Once you get beyond that, I don't know. I, I think that's one of the problems now with like social, social media contacts, um, people that you, you, you know, you know, and I think that's one reason um, so many people who, I think this is one of the contributing reasons why so many people who, who reach some level of notoriety uh, become difficult because we're not really prepared for more than a hundred people to know who we are, uh, and and so I think that really causes some problems for us, right? If more than a hundred people know who you are, you're going to run into some trouble, uh, you know. So so so, you know, stay uh, stay locally famous, uh, and you'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> so. so about the demand, the severity, how much of you, like like you're saying, like doing a small act, like, yeah, versus like. Supply and supply. Like, it's more challenging, more time consuming, whatever. I guess a lot of rich people. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Like, it's almost like economics, like just supply and demand. Well, it's ex I mean, it's exactly economics. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's exactly. I, I, I mean, most of this is is definitely economics, right? And so we'll and we'll talk in a few moments. Uh, I really want to get into the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, I want you all to think about having to go to prison. Uh, for a little while and uh, really think about like strategies f for how you're going to like rat on your friends. It's really funny to say economics of, or ironic, say economics of conflict. Yeah, yeah, so so I, I think, uh, yeah, I know, right? So that's like a thing, like some people will argue like, oh, if it's true altruism, then you can't get any benefit from it. And I'm like, well, I think that's a waste of time uh, arguing about that, right? You, you're, you're obviously everything you do. Like from from an, if, if you're thinking about this just from a pure evolutionary standpoint, every action you take has to benefit you somehow or your goals somehow in the long run, right? Why do you make friendships? You make friendships with someone because you're expecting them to pay you back sometime, right? And you have to have some accounting of that, which is which is really interesting how we keep track of those things. You're not, you're not really just throwing goodwill out there in the world for the fun of it. And if we've developed something that looks like we're just throwing goodwill out there in the world, it's because in the long run that comes back and benefits us somehow, even if you're not maybe consciously thinking about it. Does that make sense? So nobody's nice. Uh, reciprocal altruism, right? This is what's used to try to explain this altruistic behavior. Basically... If I do something for you, you'll do something for me later, right? I mean, it's that simple. I mean, it's it's really that's really what it comes down to. Let's talk about going to jail. <laughs> so the prisoner's dilemma. 
basically, here's the premise, and there are a ton of variations on this, right? There are a ton of variations. Uh, but here's the basic idea. You and one of your friends have committed a crime, and you've been caught. And the police take you to two separate rooms. And they say to you, to each of you independently, if you admit to doing it, here's the penalty. If you deny doing it, and your friend denies doing it, the penalty is really small, right? Like they have to let you go. If your, you deny it, but your friend tells on you, then you're going to jail for twice as long as if you just said you did it in the first place. And then vice versa, if you say that your friend did it, and then your friend says, no, I didn't do it, then, you know, they're going to jail. So the, the basic idea is you've got a few options here, right? You can cooperate or you can defect, right? You can either say, yes, I did it, and hope your friend says, yes, I did it. You can say, yes, I did it, and your friend says, no, I didn't. And then that's called the sucker's payoff. <laughs> and guess what? Uh, then you both could defect, or right? you can both say, no, we didn't do it. Or you can say, I did it, and the other person says, no, I didn't do it. Right? So there are these different conditions. I know that's really kind of confusing. I don't think I explained that very well because I'm getting a lot of blank stares. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe you've been in a situation like this with your parents, right? And a sibling or a cousin or a friend, right? Both make sure you got, right, Michaela, you both make sure you got your story straight, but then somebody's going to fold maybe, right? And so if you do this once, if you just do this one time with somebody, the, I, the real thing you should do is, is you should both just say, yeah, we did it, because on average you're going to get the smaller punishment for that, right? You know, you're, you're reducing the risk of getting the big punishment, uh, and, and, and there you go, right? It's not too big of a deal. But one time doesn't really tell you anything, right? If you're only getting in trouble once with your friend, they're probably not that great of a friend, right, Krista? Uh, because you should get in trouble more than once with them. And so you really, you really ought to run this a number of times, right? Because, again, running at one time, again, the best is, is let's, let's actually, uh, or I'm sorry, defect not cooperate, let's defect, um, because you, you want to avoid that punishment. But if you keep doing it, right, if you keep doing it over and over and over again, a, a, as you would if you had a long-term relationship with someone, a, a strategy typically develops called tit for tat. It's pretty straightforward. Basically, start by cooperating. and then do whatever the other person does every time after that, right? So step up first and be a good person. If that person was a good person as well, just keep doing that, right? If that other person, uh, you know, defects on you and they leave you out to dry, then the next time you get a chance, do the same to them. Because not because you're trying to get back at them, although you sort of are at some level, we'll talk about that. But you want to signal to them, like, hey, that was a bad move. You know, get it together next time. Okay? And that's really it. I mean, that's that's the basic strategy. How many of you have been in a situation like this? Probably everybody, right? Okay. You relied on somebody for something, and then uh, they let you down. And then what would you do the next time? Hopefully you let them down too, right, Jason? That's what you should have done. Uh, but 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 maybe you found yourself in a situation and you weren't as motivated to help them, right? Or there was something there, right? And so you've got this sort of back and forth problem. So there you go. Now the problem with this is, if the if the the strategy, if the stable strategy or the evolutionarily stable strategy is like cooperate, then then we should never get in a situation where somebody's not cooperating, right? Because the the three keys for this to be successful is is one. Never be the first one to defect. So if both of you are not going to be the first person to defect, then you're always cooperating, right? But in, invariably, someone's going to defect, right, Chandler? It always happens, right? That's what I was so the more you don't defect, the more you cooperate, should it make it harder to defect? 
Should. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, absolutely, right? Because you're 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 sort of banking that capital, right? You're banking that time, those times you've helped someone, um, and times they've helped you, right? And so if you think about this, right? I mean, uh, if you've got a friend and you've had that friend longer, you might think it would be harder to defect on them. That's how friendships work usually. But I don't know, Josh. What are your thoughts? <laughs> what was the question again? Uh, if everybody's cooperating, it then it's going to be harder to defect over time. I just think that's how these relationships work, right? I, I mean, uh, how many of you formed a friendship ship with someone because you were sort of thrown into a situation where you had to work together and rely on that person, and you had to do that very quickly, and there was a fairly high stakes event? It happens a lot, right, JP? I mean, it's a pretty normal thing, right? Uh, you end up being friends with so you guys get assigned to a group together and you've, you've got to rely on each other and you've got to work on that project together and then as that other person continues to hold up their end of the bargain and you hold up your end of the bargain then you start to build that that together right um, yeah some people have more dramatic stories than that but it's the same process you know even sometimes if it's somebody who's not maybe um, Ide ideologically aligned with you, right? They may have different things going on in their lives. They may be in different places. But if you've kind of been in that situation where you've quickly built up that cooperative bank, what are you going to do? Can't defect on them. I mean, yes, you can. But then you'd be a cheater. So the the question really is like. If everybody's just going to be nice to everybody else, then why should I be nice? Because they're going to be nice to me anyway, right? And then if I can just go around to all of these different people and they'll just be nice to me, help me out when I'm in trouble, I can just cheat, right? I can act like I'm going to be nice. I can act like I'm going to be altruistic and, and respond, but, but maybe I'm not, right? And so when you're in a relationship with someone, you're... you're the, what you're trying to do to make that a successful relationship is something called enlarging the shadow of the future, which is a very fancy way of saying, hey, let's see if we can make this last a while, right? <clears throat> if you're in a relationship with someone, Laura, you know it's going to end shortly. Uh, guess what you do? Whenever they do something nice for you, you got to immediately repay that. I don't have to deal with this guy again, right? Why did he hold that door for me? I'm going to have to hold the door for him now. Right? I want to do it right now. And this happens uh, once you get to a situation where you're thinking about someone getting divorced. Right, Very quickly things get repaid, good or bad. Uh, because they don't want to enlarge the shadow. They don't want to make the future any longer. Right, They want to make the future shorter. They know the end move is coming. Right, And so you're going to take actions to make sure that there's a clear end. Right, If you're in a long-term relationship with someone and they get you a gift, uh, when do you have to return that, or when do you have to get them a gift? Like you can wait a while, right, Krista? I, I mean, you don't have to like tomorrow go get them a gift, right? Because if you do, that probably says the, the foundation of that relationship is not very strong, right? That alliance has not got a lot in there to hold it together, right? If you think like, if I don't repay this favor soon, this person will think I've cheated them, right? Like, how long can you wait before they'll think you've cheated them? Sorry, I'm just thinking, like, technically it should always be a two-step forward, one-step back. Like, if you're closer to zero, and then you're... Sorry, I'm thinking of them in terms of the chart scale, but not... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. So, like, technically it should always be a positive game, but if you're closer to that zero point, you're going into the negative, that's when you would be easy. So, am I making sense? If I created this in my head, too wrong? I think you're trying to talk about free riders. Is that, is that what you think, Josh? I think he's trying to talk about free riders. And uh, he didn't know what they were because I haven't told him yet. Okay. So there, there, <laughs> there are people, Chandler, who are free riders, yeah. right? And essentially what a free rider is trying to do is uh, get the rewards or the benefits from an alliance without investing in the costs. Oh. Yeah. So this is someone who, uh, you know, would expect to get a share of the food from a hunt but maybe 
he was not uh, not you know just lagging behind, just like you know turning over stones, looking for toads. I, I, I don't know, right? Wasn't actually involved in the in the effort and didn't put any risk into it, right? Does that make sense? Is is that where you were going? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Just like philosophically, cheating doesn't make sense because the more wrong you do, the less like positive. Yeah. So it's going to be somebody that you reciprocate that you're constantly showing bad habits. Absolutely, and and we'll talk about reputation. I mean, reputation. I mean, is very important, right? So, how many of you want the reputation of being a cheater? Jason, I thought you were going to raise your hand. You, your hands moved, and I thought you were going to raise your hand. I was like, nobody wants that reputation, right? How many of you, and don't raise your hand, have ever cheated at a game, an interaction, you know, some sort of arrangement? Everybody has, right? Let's be honest, okay? How many of you have cheated at the game we play in this class? Tiffany, you looked up very guiltily right there. You're just... I'm just thinking about all the opportunities that someone could cheat. I've never done it, but I can see. Right. Think how many opportunities are Yeah, yeah. I know, right? We know who's cheated. We keep an eye on that. That's what we do when we walk around, collecting data. We're, we're not. We should. <laughs> it would be interesting. Uh, so, yeah. So, so, I mean, people are going to cheat, right? But people will often spend a lot of time trying to convince you they're not cheaters, right? Because what happens if you are a known cheater? Well, you're alone. Nobody's going to join a, an alliance with you, right, of any kind. Nobody's going to help you out. And it goes back to that um, vampire bat yeah. um, thing you brought up. Uh, there was a study. They took these vampire bats, and normally they would share blood. And so they wanted to see if they could make it where um, the sort of the bats around this one bat would not share blood with the bat by um, by turning it into a cheater. So the way they turn this bat into a cheater is um, they would uh, catch the bat and they would inflate the blood sacs basically in its body to make it look like that it had full blood sacs. So when it got back to the, back to the whatever it was, um, the other bats would perceive it as having blood and not sharing it. And so they found that these other bats got pissed off at this bat, and whenever it was low on blood, they wouldn't share with it. So we, like bats, are really good at detecting cheaters, and we hate them. I don't know where I was going with that, but... I think it was related to Tom Brady. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's For some reason, I felt like that's where that was going. Was that not... That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right. So, so detecting cheaters is not anything special we did. We do it in a different way because we're not inflating blood sacs. But that, yeah, there you go. All right. So, <clears throat> if we are actually going to um, detect cheaters, right, we have to have some mechanisms for that, okay? There have to be some things present. Uh, one of those is we have to actually be able to recognize individual humans. I, I know that seems like a very obvious thing, and again, we're, we're, we're very good at this, um, and so we don't really think about it being that important, right, Kay? We just know, like, hey, this is a person I know. It's another person. But if you're not able to recognize other people, you'll never know who cheated you, right? If everybody else looks the same to you and you assume everybody's the same, then you don't know who has been helpful and who's not been, right, Paul? It's just, it's just so you have to recognize individuals. You have to be able to remember the, the history, you know, the interactions with those individuals. Uh, we, we typically do this with, like, faces, and we have, you know, these nice memory structures. I don't know if bats have facial recognition. I know chimpanzees are looking at butt wrinkles. Uh, paper wasps actually have facial recognition, which is kind of neat. I know it's, it's really fascinating that the paper wasps do this. Uh, all species have some way that they recognize. I mean, all species that are going to have some sort of altruistic behavior or some sort of reciprocal behavior are going to be able to recognize individuals. Uh, some folks, or some, some species would do this with uh, Michael Factory cues, <clears throat> other things. Uh, we also need to be able to communicate <clears throat> what our uh, uh, values are, right? Uh, and uh, we have to be able to model the values of others. Okay? So we have to kind of do that. And then the other thing that we need is we need to be able to um, 
somehow keep track of the costs and the benefits of the items that are exchanged, right? When we're, when, when we're talking about uh, vampire bats, it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? They're sharing blood. <clears throat> that's a nutrient that they need. That's, that's, that's what they need to get by. Humans, on the other hand, we, we, we share all kinds of things, right? I think ultimately it sort of boils down to the same currency. We just have to think about what that is, right? Uh, let's say in the past you've always, um, uh, you have a friend and, and you've always shared money with them, right? You've always provided them some money. What do they provide in return for you? Uh, maybe they just send you funny memes. Uh, is, is, is that enough to justify the, you know, several hundred dollars you've, you've given them over the, you're already saying no. Uh, but, but what if they, <clears throat> uh, what if they're able to get you backstage passes to your favorite concert? Now that now, now maybe that's different, right? But how do you? I mean, you know, it, we have to have some way of keeping track of this, right? And, and we do, obviously, right? Because how many of you do have friends that you provide one thing for them, but they provide something in return that's different for you? It, it's like that with all friends, right? I mean, for the most part. I mean, if you're just giving someone fifty dollars and they're giving you fifty dollars back, just keep your fifty dollars, and you don't have to, you know. Right? I guess it's when you need that $50 that might be important. <laughs> All right. So we need to be able to detect cheaters, right? And there's a particular sort of task here. And this is, this is sort of an interesting uh, test, right? So basically there's a rule. And that rule is um, if a card has a vowel on one side, then it has an even number on the other side, OK? Now, which cards do you need to turn over to see what's on the other side of them in order to, to, to prove that this, is, that this rule is true? Don't feel bad if you don't know the answer, because most people get this wrong, right? Anybody know the correct answer? Paul? Yeah, that's exactly right. Paul read the book. Yeah. <laughs> I got it wrong when I was you got it wrong. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for being honest. Because most people would say A, right? Because it's a vowel. You want to see what's on the other side. If the other side of that is an odd number, then you know, well, it's false. Okay? And so you've proven that. But most people would say the even number, right? They would say flip over the two. Because, I mean, it's, it says, how many of you thought it was the even number that you had to flip over the two? How many of you even bothered to think about it? Jason? Let's just, yeah, you thought it was the two, didn't you? Yeah, everybody falls for this. Like, and I mean everybody falls for this. Almost no one gets this right. But you really need to flip over the three. Why do you need to flip over the three? Just because there's a vowel. Yeah, right? Because you and I think JP, this is the reason so many people struggle with science. Because science is this. Science is all about what do I need to do to prove something false? And people don't really work well that way. And I think that's why they struggle with it. That's a whole separate story. We didn't evolve for science. <laughs> we evolved for, for other things. But let's, let's put this in a different situation, all right? Uh, what about this rule? If a person is drinking alcohol, then they must be 21 years old or older, right? Now, which of these four people do you need to check to see what's going on here? Obviously, the person drinking beer. We need to see if they're 21, right? And then probably the person who's not 21, right? Because we need to see what they're drinking, okay? Most people get this one right, right? It's, 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 it's relevant to, to a social interaction. It's relevant to a social rule. And we're able to figure this out. Those, those abstract logic problems, even though it's the exact same question, even though the, the solution is the exact same solution, it's framed differently. <clears throat> and that makes a big difference. We are definitely uh, social species and we we've evolved in that environment so it's kind of that's how we check and see who's a cheater who's cheating here right well if we want to know who's cheating we got to see who's drinking the beer and we got to see who's under the age of 21 and see if either of those people are cheating if you flip this over something number bigger than 21 you flip that over and it's not beer then you're okay <clears throat> All right, so there you go. So we want to look for somebody who's paid the, the benefit without the cost. What's also interesting is, is who do you think is the cheater? 
uh, this was an interesting, uh, people can take different perspectives, right? So it's an interesting book example in the book about uh, if somebody's worked at a company for 10 years, then they get a pension, okay? Uh, and if you were to ask people like, who's the, how do you, how do you find a cheater in that situation? What are you looking for? Uh, and it depends on whether you're taking the perspective of the employee or of the employer, right? If you're the employee, you're thinking, who's worked here 10 years and is not getting a pension? That's someone who, who's getting cheated. But if you're the employer, you're thinking, who's worked here less than 10 years but is getting a pension? And that's how you're trying to detect a cheater. So it's all about perspective too, right, Mary? All right. Uh, do you remember cheaters? That's a stupid question, right? How many, how many of you, when I said that, remembered someone who cheated you? Yeah, like everybody. everybody their face is looking at you right now. Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Seeing Tom Brady and his airbag for his brain. Sometimes I think he has an airbag for a brain. <laughs> Him and his health guru. TV 12, man. Traumatic brain injury 12. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, at least Gronk fixed his CTE. I was worried about that. He just rubbed some CBD oil on his head. <laughs> Took care of it. That's a whole side story, Krista. One, who knows if Gronk has CTE? I'm pretty confident he does. Um, I'm pretty confident anybody in the NFL has some degree of CTE, right? Or will have. I don't think you can cure it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yes, we remember cheaters. Uh, in fact, we actually, there's been some evidence that says maybe we remember cheaters better than cooperators. It's a little more nuanced than that, probably. We're probably really great at remembering the exact situation of when someone cheated us. Uh, we're probably really good at that. Uh, but, uh, but maybe not as, as, we're probably not better at remembering cheaters than cooperators. Because you, you would want to remember cooperators as well, right? You may owe them something in the future. Okay, so you want to kind of remember them. And you also want to cooperate with them uh, again, right? So that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, we want to detect cheaters. Do we want to talk about, yeah, we probably do, right? So there's this idea about indirect reciprocity. Uh, sometimes people can give you benefits without really meaning to, right? Uh, Paul, again, you remember the example from the book, being the only guy who read the chapter, uh, about the uh, physically formidable guy that lives on your block that keeps the burglars away, right? Uh, he's not really doing that to help you. He just happens to be a, you know, a big intimidating guy and he scares away criminals. So you get some benefit from that. That's awesome. How many of you hang around with someone uh, because they have some cool characteristic, they have some cool access that you're not getting elsewhere, but they're not really putting any effort into giving you those benefits, right? So this is somebody who, um, let's think about this. Let's give an example. Uh, the example in the book is like people who speak different languages or different dialects, but maybe Maybe, I, I don't know, I had a friend in high school whose grandparents uh, owned a movie theater. I, I would like to think I liked the guy because he was a nice guy, but I, I, maybe not. Maybe I just like free movies. Uh, and so it wasn't costing him anything to, you know, let me walk in with him to a free movie, right? That was kind of cool. Uh, so, so there's kind of an indirect reciprocity. So there you go. Also, we are much more generous when other people are watching uh, than, than when other people aren't watching. <clears throat> right? Why? Well, we'd kind of like other people, Paul, to think we're nice. Right? We'd like other people to think about our reputation uh, as being a cooperator. Right? And so this is why if you ask uh, people to... All right. Uh, so right now we've got this United Way campaign going on. Okay, I don't know if you guys get emails about this. I do. They want employees to donate to the United Way campaign, right? You know what I do? I delete those emails. <clears throat> uh, not because I don't think the United Way is good. I don't know. I can tell you anything about them, to be honest. Uh, but because that's a very private email, I'm like, I, I don't care, right? But what if uh, somebody came in right now and said, hey, we're taking up donations for United Way. 
How many of you are going to donate something? Well, I bet a lot of you'd raise your hands, right? Josh, I got an email from you recently about donating things. You should just jump into people's classes and ask them for things because they'll be more likely to, to donate. That's true. Yeah, we should do that. There you go. You all have extra gift wrapping paper. I'd like it. You can drop it off in the grad lounge. I'd appreciate it. Thanks. See? Now, if, if you got the email from Josh like I did, you'd have deleted it. Uh, <laughs> actually, what annoyed me was that Kristen also sent me an email about it. I, was, uh, I don't apparently have access to the Savvy list, sir. Oh. So I can't, so I was like, yeah, send this to everybody. Again, just the people who already got it. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just joking. It, it didn't bother me, but I was like, oh, I should take a look at that. So there you go, right? So, so word of mouth reputation. Uh, what about risk pooling and need need based transfers? Uh, basically, having friendships is is like insurance, right? It's it's like oh, you know, uh, when things get tough for me, these people are going to help. And some cultures they even have like an obligatory system, right? Where you like if you're if you're if you're listed in the top three friends for this guy, you got to help him if he's in trouble. Uh, and by turn, he has to help you if you're in trouble, right? And so you have to kind of do that. Don't they get very specific with it too? Like in the Messiah, you have an, a, a sutra for like someone who helps you with the house, <clears throat> sutra for someone who helps you with your garden, uh, one who helps you with hunting. So they get very specific in the system. Yeah. So then you can have multiple. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is, is something sort of. Typically, that develops in very unstable situations uh, where there is a lot of risk. I think this is why, again, we don't necessarily see a lot of that now. Uh, things are much more predictable for us, you know, at least those of us who are you know, sort of in a Western industrialized culture. Uh, what about cost signaling, right? How many of you have ever thrown a big party for somebody? <clears throat> Yeah, why'd you do that? To look good. Yeah. <laughs> Just be honest. <clears throat> it's exactly what. But that's a very honest signal, right? I mean, if you can throw a big cool party, then that says you've got some extra resources. You've got some extra uh, capital that you can put forth, and, and maybe people will want to cooperate with you because they know that that's clear evidence that you're willing to, to contribute uh, to relationships, right? So there you go. So now I'm thinking about a really long game for someone. Like we're going to throw a big party, and then I'm going to try to, you know, like do a really big but cheap party, and then try to get more resources out of all the people that I invited, and then I'm just going to move town. <clears throat> that was the end of that story. I'm just going to reap a bunch of benefits and leave. <clears throat> Nobody thinks that's a good idea. Why does no one think that's a good idea? We've evolved mechanisms of altruism and mechanisms to detect cheaters. <clears throat> cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. Why is that? I was thinking about that earlier. Like, what's pumpkin have to do with it? I was like, is pumpkin... If I eat pumpkin, do I look... I mean, I mean, I mean do, I, do I look like I have more... Re Maybe I look like I have fewer resources. Like, if I eat a bunch of pumpkin, my face turns orange, do I look sick? What people has roots and like harvest festivals. I don't know, Paul. You should look into that and tell us next week. Because I'm going to forget about it <clears throat> by the time I leave class. All right. Uh, gratitude. Uh, yeah, we should think about emotions briefly, right? Uh, gratitude. How many of you have ever felt gratitude? Yeah, I, hopefully most people have. What about anger? Yeah, no. Never felt anger? Definitely felt anger. Definitely felt anger. What about guilt? Now tell me about that one. I don't know that one. <laughs> so uh, what, what do these things do for us, right? Well, well definitely gratitude it, it motivates you to cooperate. Anger, what's interesting about anger is, is it makes you want to punish non-cooperators. And, and punishing non-cooperators is like a really uh, fascinating thing to think about. Uh, because you have to actually be willing to punish non-cooperators. Most people aren't, like, like not everyone's willing to do this, right? And people who are willing to do this tend to get uh, a little extra prestige, right, if, if they are uh, willing and able to do this. Um, like on weekly scoring sheet. Yeah, who's going to punish non-cooperators? 
I was thinking by getting like a judge's robes. Those would be fun, right? That's why I should wear to class. Get a gavel. No, nobody thinks that's good. And uh, guilt, actually. Um, if you don't help someone when you should have or could have, then you're, you're likely to feel guilty about that. Do we want to talk about the banker's paradox? Basically, the idea here is you don't have unlimited resources. And you, you want to invest what resources you do have. You want to make good investments, right? And so this is the thing about the bank. Uh, the people who need the money the most from the bank are the people least likely to pay it back, right? If you don't need money, that means you have a lot of it. And so if someone gives you a loan, you can easily pay that back, right? You have some sort of resources there. Uh, if you're in need of money and you try to go get a loan, that that, that obviously right there it says you're in need of money, right? And and so your ability to pay that back may not be as high, right? You're a poorer credit risk. <clears throat> so the bank is constantly uh, struggling with this, right? Like who do we loan money to because we need to get the money back? Uh, because more people need money than the bank has money, right? And so they typically lend money out to people who don't need it as much, right? Uh, because those are the people most likely to pay it back. That's kind of the way economics works. Uh, it's, it's a similar situation with um, with re relationships, cooperative alliances, right? Your the people that you would want to help are going to be people who would be likely to turn around and be able to help you, right? Which are probably the people least in need of support. Okay. This is why you typically look for folks who have like a temporary need, right? Temporary needs are great. I can provide someone a small bit of resources now to get them through a brief period of time when they will recover and then be able to give me uh, resources in return, right, when I need that. Um, if you find someone who's got a chronic need, uh, you might not be as likely to uh, continue to try to support them, right, because you're going to be continuing to sink resources into them and not likely to get anything back. Does that make sense? So there you go. So don't be nice to people. Only be nice to people temporarily down on their luck. That way they can pay you back later. Right, Chandler? I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, if 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 you're hunting and you're hunting with your friend and uh, your friend doesn't do that great of a job today, but normally they're pretty good, you give them a little food. But if you're hunting with your friend and they're like constantly just inept, should you continue to help them? <laughs> you, you don't want to say no, but but. I was thinking like training like you know a dog. You know what I mean? Yeah. Constantly giving the trees after lessons. Really, should you stop that? Just won't cooperate. I don't know. Yeah. Training like primitive like hunting dogs or something. Yeah. It works. All right, so that's bankers. Uh, oh, here's what you should do. Uh, you should become irreplaceable, right? How many of you have ever uh, been upset when a new person tries to join your friend group who might have a similar set of skills or bring something similar to that uh, alliance or, or, or group that you bring. This is pretty common, right? I mean, this is a pretty common thing. Um, <clears throat> let's imagine you're the one person in your group who's good at making cupcakes. Like, and that's, that's the, right, Mary, that's the skill you have. And so that's, that's irreplaceable, right? Because everybody loves cupcakes, right? And so you, despite whatever else it is that you do, you make cupcakes and people value that. And they want those cut right? I mean, that makes sense to me. What happens now if someone comes along who is an equally good cupcake maker? I know, right? That's the face. Right there, you just made the face. Right? Like, I don't think so, right? Like, what are you going to do to that person? You can push them down a flight of stairs. Um, no? Hit him in the head with a rock? No, maybe that, right? Uh, you're, you're not probably going to be kind to them, right? Because they've now figured out a way to replace you, right? And so why should you ever help anybody? Uh, even if they have a chronic need, 
Chandler, maybe that friend who's really bad at hunting is really good at something else, and no one else is really good at that something else, they're now irreplaceable. Okay? He's horrible at hunting, but you know what? He's got a real vast knowledge of, uh, you know, basic first aid and healing techniques, right? So maybe he's worth hanging around, keeping around, because, I mean, the guy couldn't catch a rabbit if he had to. But uh, if you've got, uh, you know, some sort of rash or if you've got a, a broken bone, he has some, some knowledge to help you fix that, right? And so he's irreplaceable now. That's pretty cool, right? So work on being irreplaceable if you don't want to be, you know, kicked out of your friend group. But that's basically it. How do you become irreplaceable? We've talked about that. Costs and benefits, right? So what are the benefits uh, of friendships? Sexual access. I'm not wanting you to answer this, but just think about uh, how many people do you know who've had sex with their friends? Yeah, you don't have to answer that, right? Nobody, everybody's... <laughs> Trying to hold that one in. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a stronger drive in, in, in males than females. Again, males are more likely to look for those short-term sort of mating opportunities. Uh, but females, on the other hand, I mean, if this is a person who's been hanging around for a few years, you know, but doing something right to keep them around, uh, you know, maybe if there's a kid that comes out of it, they'll stay around and take care of it. Obviously, they're bringing something to that alliance, right? So there you go. Uh, obviously, get resources and protection, right? You should always make friends with someone bigger and stronger than you, right? I mean, that, I mean, that makes perfect sense to me, uh, you know, because then they can scare away other folks, right? That makes a lot of sense. Uh, this tends to be a stronger motivation uh, for females to make friends with males than for males to make friends with females, right, for that uh, sort of protection aspect. And then you can get information about members of the opposite sex, right? Please don't answer this either. Uh, but how many of you have asked a uh, same-sex, or I mean an opposite sex friend, uh, for uh, information about other members of the opposite sex? It's a pretty common thing, right? It's a pretty common thing to do. And in fact, people are more likely to trust that information than information that they get from a same-sex friend about the opposite sex. Right? Some weird. Noise. Well, I mean, I mean, it's pretty simple. You're gonna trust somebody that's got the parts or not? Yeah. I mean, if I want to ask somebody about an Xbox, I'm not gonna go ask a guy who owns a PlayStation. I'm gonna ask a guy who owns an Xbox. It's that simple, right? Yeah. You put it in terms you understand. Uh, cost, intrasexual rivalry. How many of you have ever been in, no, don't answer this one either, uh, have ever been in a rivalry with one of your friends for the same potential mate or mating partner or just person you want to eat ice cream with? It happens. It, it's fairly common, right? Uh, again, it's a fairly common thing, so that's a potential cost. Uh, you know, you think your friend's pretty cool, your friend thinks you're pretty cool, uh, and then there's like some third person that you're both interested in. How can you like, Compete with that friend you think's pretty cool. You don't want to lose like the cupcakes that they're making for you, but at the same time, you, you know, want to be able to have opportunities with that other person. It's a real delicate balance. So there you go, right? Nobody's terribly excited about this one. I didn't think this was going to be like a, like a like put my head down and not talk about stuff. But other than Chandler, and I guess you know, Paul who actually read the chapter. Uh, so there you go. That's just that graph I was showing you or talking to you about. Not a big deal. Oh, mate poachers. I don't know. That sounds exciting, right? Sometimes friends are seen as mate poachers. How many of you have ended a friendship because one of your friends uh, poached a mate? Don't have to answer that. But that's a fairly common thing as well, right? Uh, again, two of you are going for the same other person. One of you is successful. Uh, that other person's like, well, I'm done with you, mate poacher. It's not the same as an egg poacher. Well, that's kind of the nice way to put it, though. When I think of mate poaching, I think you're already in a relationship with somebody, and then you're best. That friend. happens too. That. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Although you're going to be less upset about that uh, if it's a friend than if it's a, a relative. 
for some reason you shouldn't be, but you're going to be. So maybe that works. I don't know. Not a big deal, right? You guys understand this. Cooperative co oh, sometimes you need more than two people. Uh, and that's going to be like a like a coalition is kind of the technical word there, right? I don't know. An alliance is typically two. We think of a coalition more than that. Um, so so you need a lot of people. Uh, again, Chandler, here's your free riders. These are people who are uh, like, oh yeah, let's go do that. And and then when it comes down to it, they're kind of like hiding in the background. Uh, like, great job. Yeah yeah, we we were awesome out there, but. Uh, in, in fact, I wasn't really doing anything. So. And you do want to punish those people. Uh, how many of you have ever tried to um, outdo someone, like in terms of being nice? Right? Competitive altruism, right? That's kind of a weird one, right? <laughs> right? Uh, somebody was like, oh, I got you a gift of this value. And somebody's like, I got you a gift of that value plus X. Uh, and then somebody's like, oh, I'm going to add more, you know, right? So you just try to continue to be the nicer person. I, what's that? Uh, I think it was a State Farm commercial. Is it State Farm? Where they're like trying to do 100 nice things or something. And then the guy's like saving the whale at the end. Have I seen that commercial? Krista, have you seen it? Yes. You feel like yes. Feel like yeah, so it's just like, you know, the one guy's like, oh, I'm going to save my colleague who's choking. He does a Heimlich. And then somebody's like, oh, I'm helping an old lady cross the street. And then it's like, then this other guy's like saving a beached whale. And you like keep trying to do bigger and bigger nice things to, to appear more altruistic. How many of you have a sibling? You try to buy your parents better gifts than the sibling. Anybody do that one? Huh? Why? Why did somebody laugh at that? Just, yeah. Know. Do you do that? I think some people try to do that, right? See, I can't do that because I get screwed every year. My sister has like an actual like full time job. Oh. I do not. So you have to become irreplaceable. Are you good at making cupcakes? <laughs> <laughs> So my, this semester, I didn't cook at all. That was my go-to example. Anybody good at making cupcakes that would like to help uh, a fellow uh, student? No? I've got these things called energy balls. They're like That's the end of the story, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of the story. It's We're like done. Like We're done. Black seed and like okay, that sounds good. It's delicious. Okay. You can make cupcakes? Okay. Okay. Worked at a bakery for two years. So there you go. That's an irreplaceable skill. <laughs> Cupcake. Yeah, I mean, everybody loves cupcakes, right? That's a known fact. Uh, yeah, so sometimes you have this. Com yeah. So what do you do instead? Hope for the best. I, I work at a chocolate place, though, when I'm back home, so I get to give them really good chocolate. That's. That's irreplaceable. Yeah. This is, is it just regular chocolate or is no, it? No, it's Swiss chocolate. Uh, that's something. So now, see, that's irreplaceable. <laughs> you, you bring that to see. Think of you could advertise this, and you could make more friends, or make better friends. You don't necessarily need more friends. Uh, and you can only have so many friends at a time. I mean, there's like your friend slots. I guess we should talk about that for a little bit, right? Um, so you only have so many. I mean, there's like a limited number, right? Chandler, people you can like really keep track of. And they, they all have to sort of bring something to that relationship, right? So if you can bring chocolate, I mean, that, that right there, anybody have an open friend slot and they're looking for someone who brings chocolate? That's what we should do. Everybody go up to the board and write down the one thing you bring to the to a potential alliance and we'll see if we can match some people up. Nobody thinks that's a good idea. I have all of these great ideas, Krista, and then there is uh I know. Yeah. 
side thing. We all have she's the chocolate friend now. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Chandler can get you salt. Is that accurate? Yeah. I thought so, right? Don't you don't you you grow salt? <laughs> you can call it that. You can call it that. I don't think Yeah. Is it salt mining? Is that what you do? Is that how you get salt? I don't know how to get salt. We evaporate salt water. You evaporate salt water. It's a natural aquifer from the Pacific Ocean. I have this ocean. <laughs> so, Chandler, do you want to tell them where you work or where you have work? Thank you. Is that the, Krista? Did that help you? Yeah, I was like, why am I talking to Chandler about salt? <clears throat> it didn't make any sense, did it? That was a good pun right there. Yeah. I like that. It gets very hot. Yeah, I would say so. Huh. How about that? Chocolate, salt. <clears throat> Energy balls. <laughs> there are costs. Remember the costs associated with friendships. Uh, there are costs. <laughs> costs. I just, Paul. I never know where your stories are going, and so I just, I, I, I have a very quick trigger on, on, cut. Let's, let's end that story. When you started, I've got energy balls. Uh, I, I really didn't know where that was going. <laughs> I'm glad it went there and not other places, but that, so there you go. All right, questions, what other things do we need to talk about?